Good evening, everyone. My name is Jasmine, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm excited to introduce this event with Chris Wiggins and Matt Jones, joined by Melissa Franklin, presenting How Data Happened, a history from the age of reason to the age of algorithms. As you may have noticed, Matt Jones is not here physically with us today. He is feeling under the weather, so he joins us virtually. Up there. Tonight's event is part of our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. To learn more about the series and our up other upcoming events, you can check out the page harvard.com science or sign up for our mailing list. Before we get started, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items. First, just a quick reminder to silence your cell phones for the talk. Tonight's event will conclude with some time for your questions. Just raise your hand during the Q&A portion and one of our event staff will bring you a microphone. And thank you so much for supporting our series by buying books from Harvard Bookstore. And thank you to our friends at Harvard for all of your help in making events like this possible. If you haven't picked up a copy of How Data Happened Yet, or if you would like your copy signed and personalized, we will be moving to Cabot Library just across the hallway right after this event for a signing and reception. Now, I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Chris Wiggins is an Associate Professor of Applied Mathematics at Columbia University and the Chief Data Scientist at the New York Times. At Columbia, he is a founding member of the Executive Committee of the Data Science Institute and of the Department of Systems Biology and is affiliated faculty in statistics. He is a co-founder and co-organizer of Hack NY, a nonprofit which since 2010 has organized student hackathons in the fellows program, a structured summer internship at NYC Startups. Matt Jones is the James R. Barker Professor of Contemporary Civilization at Columbia University. He is the author of Reckoning with Matter, Calculating Machines, Innovation, and Thinking About Thinking from Pascal to Babbage, and The Good Life and the Scientific Revolution, Descartes, Pascal, Leibniz, and the Cultivation of Virtue. He has received fellowships from the Mellon Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the National Science Foundation. They are joined on stage tonight by Melissa Franklin, professor of physics at Harvard University and founding member of our Harvard Science Book Talk series. Tonight, our speakers are here in person and virtually to discuss how data happened. I'll leave the explaining to the professionals tonight, but I'll leave you with a review from former US Chief Data Scientist DJ Patil who raves that this is the first comprehensive book at the history of data and how power has played a critical role in shaping the history. It's a must read for any data scientist about how we got here and what we need to do to ensure that data works for everyone. We're so pleased to host this event here at the Harvard Science Center tonight. Please join me in welcoming Chris Wiggins, Matt Jones, and Melissa Franklin. So um, I, I just wanna add that Matthew Jones was an undergraduate at Harvard and a graduate student at Harvard. And even though he's only very little there, when we finish the introduction, he'll be bigger. Excellent. Oh, so is now a good time for me to talk? Yeah, I would, I would love you to tell okay. us. I'm, I'm actually, I'm pretty kind of interested. You taught this course yes. with, together. So I gave, a, I presented, a, 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 I prepared a few slides about the origin of the book and the origin of the class. Excellent. Okay, so maybe I'll talk through that first. Yep. So if I may, um, and Professor Jones will help through some of these slides. Um, briefly, I thought I would discuss how this book came to be. And this is a university, so I thought I would emphasize the fact that this book really was born of a class. Uh, and so the class originally was called Data, Past, Present, and Future. If you'd like to know more about that class, it's at the GitHub URL at the bottom. Uh, and to summarize, part of what we were getting at in the class are these three images, one image of the book, but also of a dumpster fire, uh, which is a common way that people talk about the challenges of our online ecosystem and the way that data-empowered algorithms are shaping our personal, professional, and political reality. And the dumpster fire is paired with Buzz Lightyear because Buzz Lightyear is filled with boundless optimism. And we would like for students to be realistic about the dumpster fires that are on the internet, or perhaps the dumpster fire that is the internet, uh, but at the same time, to have some optimism about the forces that are shaping and will continue to shape our data-mediated realities. Um, and with that, just briefly, in, in just a few minutes together before we get to a discussion, uh, a, a story of the class and the, and the book and the class behind the book. 
this all really began, began with a dinner with students that was completely Matt's arrangement and at Matt's house. So Matt, would you be willing to share the story of the dinner? Yeah, so Chris had been kind enough to come to my first uh, lecture ever on the history of machine learning when I was first feeling my way around this. Um, and I serve here at Columbia in, uh, in, in the position of sort of a, a, a house dean um, in, a camp, in a dorm. And so I invited Chris to come speak with a group of undergraduates who I knew would be excited, exciting to, excited to work with him in a, in a, in a close-up setting. And as the conversation uh, went on that evening, the students started suggesting that the two of us ought to come together um, and, and teach a class and, and the mutual overlap of our interests, that is both the history um, and, and of machine learning. And to some extent, it's political and ethical uh, uses. Um, and so the, you know, the, the spark for the class, it really did arise from uh, student interest and students saying, well, you, there's no reason some sort of administrative boundary ought to prevent you um, from, uh, uh, from, from teaching together. And not long after, uh, you know, one of these sort of uh, endless stream of emails one gets about, oh, here's a possibility for teaching something in a new and innovative way, way came. And sure enough, we applied and uh, fortunately, we got the, the money to do this. And hence, we uh, created a, 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 a new kind of class, initially as a seminar, that would draw both students from the humanities and students from a more technical background in together in the same room and try to draw on both the sets of competencies those students had to think through a lot of the issues of concern with the explosion of data and its analysis. Yeah, so this digital asset that I'm showing, Matt, is actually an email exchange between the two of us uh, in which Columbia announced that there would be new funding for classes specifically cross-taught by faculty from two different schools, in our case, it's Faculty of Arts and Sciences and the School of Engineering, which I forwarded to you a minute later, and you replied to two minutes later saying, yes, we should apply to this thing. Uh, yeah, it took us three minutes to make that decision. <laughs> yes. Uh, across the two cultures, meaning the, the cultures of the humanities and the culture of the sciences. And when we were able to get together at his house, um, We've obscured the PII in the form of the email addresses of the students, but kept the column that shows their school affiliation. So CC is the more humanist-oriented students at Columbia. Cs are the engineers. So we were able to get a good mix of students from across the two cultures, encouraging us to think about turning that mutual interest in how data got this way into an actual class. Um, so when we started thinking about what the goals for the class were, one was to reach across the two cultures and to teach material that we thought was genuinely new to both communities and would challenge their multiple capabilities. A functional capability, meaning that we wanted to teach the class in Python so that students would actually engage with code, but also a critical capability so that students would be able to think critically about algorithms, the way algorithms are shaping their lives, as well as critically when people are presented with a data-empowered story and they can think critically about what's true, what's objective, what's subjective in that narrative, and also rhetorically, meaning that students would be able to explain their world using data-enabled algorithms themselves, and, and as well as you know, data visualization and explaining the world through graphs. And of course, uh, we also wanted students to end the class with some sort of optimism. The, the students, particularly the last five or six years, have sometimes been a little worried and they enter the internet with some anxiety about the, what the world is becoming and we wanted them to end with some sort of optimism about uh, the ways that they will shape the world themselves. That led to the book. So after a few years teaching the class, 2017 and beyond, we realized that there might actually be a book here once we had done the hard work to take the subject of data and break it into 13 transitions for the 13 weeks of the class, we could say, well, maybe that could be 13 chapters, which we did. So what is the scope of the class? The scope of the class in the book is to, is to start somewhere. Every history has to start somewhere. So we started around the time that the word statistics enters the English language, which turns out to be 1770. Uh, it is a word that has nothing to do with, nothing to do with data, not in, in fact, nothing to do with mathematics, but is entirely about statecraft and trace all the way to the present day to a world in which uh, you can't tell if your emails were coming from an algorithm concocted in Silicon Valley or from your own uh, family members. Uh, and so that was the spectrum we wanted to trace over multiple centuries, and yet to give people some sense for why these terms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, statistics, are themselves drifting targets, 
uh, and also the ways that we are all going to shape the future together. Uh, the structure of the book is in three parts. Part one is a story, I would say, well told by historians about uh, how data came to be a, a field of mathematics and how data tells us what is true and what is science. Uh, and then part two begins at World War II and the creation of digital computation, at which time data goes from being a concern of pencil and paper and truth telling to an engineering concern with special purpose hardware necessary to be created, namely digital computers. And part three is really about our, our present milieu. We, don't, we do not shy away from the ethical conundra and the ethical concerns of individuals and corporations alike. We try to spell out some of the particularly um, pointed problems that people are concerned about, as well as possible solutions. Matt, anything you want to add to the arc of the class? Yeah, so throughout the book, uh, we're deeply interested in the way in which data from, uh, its, uh, from its 18th century uh, moment of coming together to the present has been profoundly uh, focused on the questions of classification and predictions about human beings. And we trace that throughout. And as the book develops and statistics and the accumulation of data becomes ever more uh, a central component of, of our societies, um, uh, the book takes on other kinds of history. So it comes to be more preoccupied with questions of large scale infrastructure, particularly around the, the Second World War, and also questions of labor, who is doing calculations, and then how is that calculation both substituted by uh, electronic computers and not substituted by electronic computers, an issue that's very much uh, in, in the news today around something like uh, chat GPT. Um, and Likewise, we tell the story of ethics not solely from the standpoint of a kind of reflection on ethical principles, but how con concerns about ethics and the politics of data are there from the start. And we look at current controversies and, and current movements um, through both a historical as well as a kind of normative lens. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so what did we learn from teaching the book and what do we hope readers learn? Um, personally, let's see if I can move forward. Uh, the ARC, we really learned from the students. So we started teaching the class, and often the students were pushing us to take on certain topics, including the ethics of data. Uh, we learned that there's important material that's being taught neither to the humanistic students nor to the future statisticians, uh, and we felt like that was important stuff for people to know, whatever their future may hold. Um, we learned a lot about how Data, the story of data over the last 200 years is really a story of truth and also a story of power. Truth in part because over the last 200 years, data has often had a forefront seat at the table in deciding what is really true and remains to this day something in which data comes with a certain rhetorical preeminence. The presence of data often does not invite people to question where those data come from. Even the word itself, data, means to give, as though, well, somebody just gave me these data. Uh, and so we're trying to encourage people to think about the subjectivities, the hidden subjectivities, and the design choices behind the way data are cooked. They are never raw. Um, what do we hope people get out of the book? Uh, well, we hope one hope for me is that people think of history as useful. This is a thing Matt can't say, since he's a professional historian, whereas I am merely a fan of history. But I have found history to be extremely useful in revealing the root causes of things. Around AI, which is a field where people over the last few months have said, literally said, can't we just slow things down? Uh, I would say that history does give us a way of slowing things down because it encourages us to take a historical perspective in which we realize that some of the things that we are facing now actually were created 20, 10, 200 years ago rather than um, last week. We hope that people see in a historical thread some common solutions from previous problems. We hope that people see that the many uses, even of what we mean by data, has its own politics. I don't mean politics in the sense of voting, but of or relating to the dynamics of power, uh, including a critique of data and its own Im implicit truthiness, that you know, giving something a number somehow comes with some sort of um, extra sense that it must be more true than something that is merely a qualitative statement, and also tracing the role of data and power. We trace um, quite explicitly the role of state power and corporate power and people power in shaping our future together. Um, in the book, we say, a historical view makes the present strange as it shatters the fallacy of technological determinism, which is a, an idea that I learned from Professor Jones. Professor Jones, do you want to jump in on that? Well, what I would say is, you know, the professional vocation of a historian of tech 
of science or technology is to say things don't necessarily need to be the way they are. And so the history we're presenting is the history of the choices that have been made and how they might be made differently. But it's also a history that occasions the sort of uh, a, a critical inquiry, not in the sense of throwing away uh, everything or thinking that um, one needs to fall into some sort of relativistic spiral, but rather that uh, a sort of deeply critical approach to the limits of the kind of knowledge that data presents was the precondition of much of what was produced. So criticism should be connected to optimism. And what we hope to do in the book, as we hope to do in the class, is to give people tools for thinking and acting critically in different ways, uh, in part through a, a sort of historical approach that shows other pathways that might have been followed. Thank you, Matt. Um, yes, a less scholarly quote I think I added is, no fate but what we make. That is, we hope we close the book by giving students some, and readers really, some sense that uh, the future is still contested and up to all of us. Uh, and with that, I think we have some time for some questions from Professor Franklin and then questions from the audience. Yes? Great. So uh, I actually read the book, and it's, uh, it's great. I couldn't, I didn't finish because I couldn't stop reading it carefully. Um, and what it is filled with is a lot of fantastic anecdotes that are true. <laughs> <laughs> and the first one, I, I just want to start, I, I have like a million questions, and I'm hoping you're going to have some questions later. but. The first one was kind of really interesting to me, this idea of the average man and error theory. And I love this idea that you can just say, OK, let's measure everybody. <laughs> let's measure every man. Let's measure their height. And let's make a plot, a histogram, or whatever, graph. And, uh, and then we'll say, oh, what's the average? And this was a big step forward at some point, where they started talking about the average of man's height. And you'd think, well, that couldn't be bad. You know, maybe you could measure it as a function of year, the average height of man. Maybe you could see what shape it was, kind of bell curve. And then they, the, you'd say, that can't be evil. But then the eugenicists came and looked at the same plot. This is what you say in the book. You're looking at me like I didn't understand it, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you looked at the same plot and said, oh, uh, if I take the high part, all the tall people, and I just get rid of everybody else, I can make a better human race. Which is a very different idea of looking at the same data. And it seemed to me that that was a really turning point. And I, I should stop talking and ask you whether, um, uh, to me, that was a subtle difference that's very interesting. Yes. So that's one of the turning points in the book was um, in the late Victorian period to take the latest tech of the day, which in this case was statistics, and to think how could we use that tech, that, to, that tool, uh, to ensure the continued greatness of the empire, or in this case, in the, in the concern about the waning greatness of the Victorian empire, to ask how can we use data to make the empire great again. Uh, and for Galton in particular, Galton was looking at uh, regression, which we now think of as commonplace, but he was looking at how, how, is, how did it come to pass that some people are so great, like me and my cousin Charles Darwin? How, how, is it, how is it possible that some families are just so great? And he you know, made charts of the greatness of different families, his own included. And he spent some time looking at height as a proxy for greatness. Uh, and, he, and he draws this graph of the height of parent versus height of children and notices that even when you have tall parents, the children are not always quite as tall. It's kind of a, a regression. And that is the origin of the word regression, which is part of all statistical vocabulary today. Most people who learn regression live and die without ever knowing that it was created in this particular context of regression. Um, it's just the act of fitting things to a straight line. But it happens to be called regression for a reason. So um, Sir Francis Galton gave us the word regression. He gave us the word correlation. And he gave us the word eugenics. And they were all part of the same program for him, which is to make the Victorian empire great. I think it's an important story for us to tell, um, not only because it's true, and it's, it's really an integral part of the development of statistics, even before there was an idea of mathematical statistics as a field, but also because Galton and Florence Nightingale and others thought of themselves as the progressives. You know, they, saw, they thought of themselves as the people who were doing God's work and making the empire great again and doing things that were great for society. They didn't think of themselves as the baddies who were using math to oppress people. 
uh, and that's part of the story that I think we should um, capture throughout that and other chapters, is the ways that people don't think through the consequences of their analyses and also the policies that are implied by their analyses time and time and again for centuries. So um, you mentioned Florence Nightingale. Yes. So you've probably all heard of Florence Nightingale. She has a lantern and stuff, but that's all that I remember. She was a nurse. But can somebody tell us about Florence Nightingale, the statistician? Because I was completely pumped by this um, idea that she was an early statistician, even though I know statisticians are not held in high esteem at, at that time. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just jump in. I mean, she has a sort of lifetime of different kinds of a, a accomplishments as a statistician. In the book, we, you know, we connect uh, her uh, advocacy uh, for health measures um, uh, in, in, in hospitals uh, with the creation that she is a, a great creator of new forms of graphical representation of data visualization as they say today, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, precisely as a form of rhetoric that was important in, con in, in, in trying to convince um, various governmental bodies uh, in, in England to take seriously um, the need to transform hospitals. Um, and for her, this was intimately connected to questions of empire, that it was a tremendous waste for so many of the soldiers to perish, not on the battlefield only, but uh, also in hospital. Along, alongside that, uh, this great uh, dy dynamism and visualization and the idea that the, the way that you convince people should be through, through statistic, statistics, she became a huge advocate of simply the idea of hospitals regularly collecting statistics um, throughout her in, entire life. And, and she also became a great uh, devotee of this Belgian astronomer that you alluded to named Catelet and his idea that statistics ought to be used in general um, in resolving various kinds of policy questions. Um, and so she tried to apply that to questions like compulsory education and then uh, uh, the question of India in the empire uh, preoccupied her greatly. Um, and to the end of her life, she advocated for both academic statistics and statistics in government to be a much more central focus. So she's quite an extraordinary figure. Um, and she actually became uh, a member of both, uh, uh, it was an invited member of the Royal Statistical uh, Association and the American Statistical Association. So um, there's another, so throughout this book, there's a number of interesting people. It's really nice because you sort of follow history through interesting people, which I like. One of the really interesting people was a man named Mahalanobis. Yes, Mahalanobis. Mahalanobis, who was from India and who studied in England and then went back and somehow used what he learned about statistics from these reasonably well-intentioned bad people <laughs> to go back to India and to sort of use, take data to show that the caste system was wrong or it wasn't true. It didn't, am I, am I anywhere close here? There's a, there's a lot to unpack in the way that India, during the, during the Raj, like during the British occupation, reified caste in different ways, including quantitatively. And in his case, the role of spending time in England and bringing back to India Biometrica, a, a set of um, journal volumes with the latest, again, the latest tech of the day, which in this case was using data to sort people into different groups. Matt, do you want to elaborate on Professor Malanobis? Yeah, though, I mean, I should say he's uh, an absolutely central figure uh, in, in the development of in, in the Indian state, both in the colonial in the in in the colonial period and then in, in the independence. So he's he's enormously important in the creation of, a, a, as it were, a, a statistical state. Uh, in India. And what he did essentially was to, he sort of absorbed all of this new form of statistical analysis that was associated with this journal Biometrica and Carl Pearson. And when he when he applied it, he applied it to um, data sets that had been produced in, for largely imperial purposes and which in many ways reified castes. Um, 
And yet he applied it with much greater sort of care to understand the way in which the things that were thought to be cast were much more sort of transient kind of categories. And so he serves as an interesting example, not just of someone who took up this model that statistics would be central to statecraft, but also the, the applied, as it were, an internal critique that too many of the claims that had been used um, in what we present as this largely British story, um, that it, it was statistics critiquing statistics, better statistics pushing back against some of the more um, profoundly uh, dangerous facets of, of the eugenical pr program that he had uh, instructed himself in. So he's, uh, you know, and his uh, contributions in, say, pure statistics stand for by themselves, but he's also enormously important as an example of the way in which the critical use of even bad data can go in many different ways, but it can go in very powerful and transformative ways, uh, in positive ways, as well as the, the way in very negative ways. And it stands as a great example of not uh, accepting the biases in a data set, but actually being profoundly reflective about the conditions of its emergence. And at many moments, we see that, uh, that to not take the data just as given um, is, a crucial, is, is a crucial now and is crucial in the history. So, okay. You're thinking we don't want to just hear about interesting people from the past. We want to know what a data scientist is. <laughs> so what is a data scientist compared to a data analyst, compared to a statistician, compared to someone who does artificial intelligence? And I thought, uh, Chris, that yeah. because you are the chief data scientist for the New York Times. It's true. You could tell us what, what does that mean? And do you do the weather things? Do you, do you, like, do you, so I really like looking at plots in the New York Times. Um, do you have to check each one or do you, no. do you run algorithms on the data about the, what, what do you do as a chief scientist? Okay, so let me answer the first question first. Yep. So data science as a, as a field uh, has been proposed a few times but it really caught fire as a job description about 10 to 12 years ago, um, and particularly in technology companies, LinkedIn, Facebook, other companies started using the term data scientist. Um, at the New York Times, we have a data science team. Uh, we focus on developing and deploying machine learning. So as a data science team, we work closely with data analysts. Data analyst is an even older job title. I would, I would trace it to uh, John Tukey's 1962 paper, The Future of Data Analysis. Um, which clearly is less focused on, on machine learning, but certainly a lot of uh, human interaction and trying to understand the pathologies and data sets you're using. Uh, go, go on. Yeah, okay. Okay, and uh, it certainly has many roots in common with statistics in the same way that machine learning now has overlap with statistics. It didn't always have that, that um, overlap in the field of machine learning. Uh, and as far as what we do in the data science team at the New York Times, we focus on developing, deploying machine learning for newsroom and business problems. Not so much the weather, but it could be things like a recommendation engine that recommends different stories, or um, the algorithm that says when the paywall should show up and ask you to become a subscriber. Wire cutter? We certainly recommend stories on wire cutter and work with our friends at wire cutter. So uh, there's a lot of different projects. So Tukey said that, uh Data anal analysis was an art, which I like to think of because that's what I do. Good. So you're not an artist as a data scientist. I like to think that there are subjective design choices in making sense of data, and there are certainly subjective design choices in art as well. Um, so sure, I'm happy to call myself an artist. Great. Okay, wonderful. We're both artists. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, well, I think Kathy O'Neill, who wrote the Robin's math destruction. Yeah, math, the math destruction. Wrote, we, she wrote about biases that machine learning, if you have biased data going in, you have biased data coming out, which is scary. Um, but she said she doesn't call herself a chef if she, has a, if she knows how to use um, pots and pans. I know how to use machine learning, but I wouldn't call myself a data scientist. So there's got to be something a little bit more. Somewhere in your book you say, or someone says, the data scientists have to 
apply it to some kind of government or business. Is that part of data science or are there pure data scientists? Okay. Because, all, yeah. All of these terms, and one of the things that we try to trace in the book is how all of these terms are themselves drifting targets. The phrase, for example, artificial intelligence, born in 1955, the mathematician who creates the term is on record as saying, I made up the term in order to get money. And when they made up the term in 1955, they didn't know what the method was going to be that would give them artificial intelligence. It's a term named entirely after an aspiration. When they write the original proposal, they're like, here's seven different ways that maybe we're going to get at it, artificial intelligence, but we're not really sure. Similarly, the phrase machine learning. Um, most people think of it as being coined in 1959. It's in a paper where the term machine learning is never de defined whatsoever, by the way. And then the phrase means different things in 1983 than it does in 2002 and 2012. Similarly for data science, and you know, I had a conversation today with people in statistics about exactly that. In the same way that there's a battle to define what ethics means in tech companies, there's a, a smaller battle happening in, in academic departments to say, well, what really is statistics for that matter? Or what really is data science? Your question presumes that there really is one true definition, but all of these terms are used by different communities in different decades to mean different things. So it could be a linear combination of all the people, statisticians, data analysts, data gatherers, it could be entirely, mathematicians. It could be entirely normative yes. and operationally set by the decisions made by departmental chairs, funding agencies, hiring managers, textbook writers. All of those people are making normative changes which shape the direction in which these terms drift. So right now, if you think of the people who are really pushing this field, yeah. are they data fluid? Are they data, <laughs> data, fluid? data fluid? Yeah. Uh, are they able to do everything? Oh, no, 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 no. So that's part of the maturation of a field is, and one of the things we trace out in the book is, if you look at the way people define data scientists in 2009, they were quite explicit about saying a data scientist should be able to um, build a data processing pipeline, do hypothesis testing, run an A-B test, communicate the results to the REST organization in a clear and concise fashion. And now, 12 years ago, you can look at a sophisticated company like the New York Times, and we have a separate group in data engineering, data analysis, data science, data governance, and it's understood that there's a maturation and these are separate crafts. It's kind of interesting. Oh, it's very interesting. It's a great book. You should read it. <laughs> no, no, it is a really good book. OK, so the, the uh, sorry. But, but and it's also interesting for us as academics, you know, yeah. like our fields themselves, you know, like, you know, we're in buildings that say physics, and it's chiseled in stone as though, you know, somebody from German research universities at the end of the 19th century said, yeah, das ist Physik, and then everything else is not allowed. You know, these fields themselves are drifting, right? Harvard created a Department of Systems Biology in 2004. Who said that's a field? Well, obviously Harvard does, and so now it's a field. Matt, I'm ranting too much. You should jump in there. I'll just say, when statistics itself, mathematical statistics, was taking form just after the war, it went heavy in the math direction. And a Columbia professor, Hotelling, wrote an essay about the dangers of any young graduate student going and getting too involved with data in an organization because it would get them away from mathematics. And that's sort of dramatically different from our current moment where the sense is there's, there's been too much of a, a danger of over-mathematization and not enough involvement in real world data. And so this contestation that Chris is talking about, which is both an intellectual one and organizational one, um, is, is, is very much one in which there are these degrees of a concern that somehow uh, math, uh, there'd been too much emphasis on certain forms of mathematical rigor rather than on the accumulation and analysis of kind of data. And to take it back to Tukey, he at one point, he, he writes in a textbook of his that we need to take on uh, the journey that's much more the journey of a, of, a, of a Sherlock Holmes, of exploring data, as well as doing confirmation in the way that uh, mathematical statistics had been focused on um, in the incarnation it had after the war. So we're interested in that, the contestation between those different moments, both in the history of statistics and data science, and also, uh, as Chris was referring to, in artificial intelligence, which moved from being a domain that was, if anything, anti-empirical to now being uh, you know, largely understood to be built upon an, an empiricism of a, at a scale that no one has previously attempted. 
So there's a part of this book that um, really changed my life. <laughs> the I know that sounds strange. For the better, I hope. And it is true. It happens <laughs> often, many <laughs> times a week. <laughs> but, but the whole, the whole, you know, in my life, being an academic, there was always students, very brilliant young students, who go and work for the NSA. They, mm. they get them in the summer, and then they catch them. And I always wondered why they did that, um, why the students went there. And I always thought they made a mistake, and I was always sad for them. Hmm. And I would go home and just cry a little bit. Um, but then I realized that what happened with data and the NSA basically has changed all of our lives completely, that the people who are working there were actually made huge, huge effect on the world and this country, which you write about in your book. Could I be wrong? Yes. Even and that I missed it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Of course, they're not very yeah. open about it, right? I mean, for, <laughs> no, for, many, for, many, for many decades, yeah. it was no such agency, right? They weren't particularly open about what was going on there. And yeah. the story began even before the NSA was the NSA, meaning the intelligence community was dealing with streams of messy data in the original data science problem. Yeah. You know, as digital computation was born. In fact, we make the point that really digital computation is created to solve this messy stream of data problem at Bletchley Park, right? It's like computation is born of data science. It's just it takes another 75 years before we find out that that's true. That said, Professor Jones is actually far more expert than I in the NSA. Did you work for the NSA? Well, I can neither confirm nor no. I did. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I, one archival thing that I consistently find are um, uh, the NSA writes to professors of mathematics and physics with flyers that are to be put on bulletin boards. So this is during the era when supposedly no one knows about the NSA. And it says, are you interested in math? Do you want to see an actual computer that you're never allowed to touch? We're the place to go. Um, you can have a really exciting career with us. And so um, they recruited heavily by saying, look, we really valorize your competencies and we're going to introduce you to things you, you didn't have. And in the book, we talk about some of the reflections of this amazing woman, uh, Juanita Moody, who spent her entire life um, working for the NSA and its predecessor agencies, saying one of her, the things she's most sad about is that, um, uh, that all this technology that they were developing couldn't be used in the outside world. Um, but there's, there's a sort of been a long, you know, multiple generations of both recruitment of mathematics Mathematicians and to some extent physicists, um, but also uh, a, a real sense that this was a place that cultivated and cared about those competencies. In more recent years, with the explosion of uh, possibilities for this kind of uh, competency in the commercial world, they of course are now challenged to hire the very same kind of people. Um, and so, uh, in more recently, part of the reason we can write the book is that they have wanted to get a little bit of this history told, that their centrality in the development of computing was something that was uh, had to be hidden for many decades, um, and now is something that they'd uh, uh, they want to celebrate to a certain extent. But our interest is not just on sort of hardware. It's also about the sort of attitude towards uh, how is it that you approach a uh, high, large computational problem? Indeed, what is it that happens when you have large scale infrastructure? And that was something they had and almost no one had until comparatively recently. Um, now, Juanita Moody, just uh, I'll just end this. She, her career um, ended in a rather, uh, rather sad way in that she got caught up in uh, the revelation of really some terrible things that the NSA had been drafted into doing and monitoring U.S. communications. Um, and so I think that, like many of the stories we tell in the bo book, it's uh, that, 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 that level of, of, of darkness and light is omnipresent. It's no, sort of not an easy ethical story or an easy political story. So I, just three days ago in the New York Times, I think, I read about uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who is one of yes. the father's parents of um, modern machine learning, yeah. um, who, who moved to uh, Canada from the US a long time ago um, because he didn't want to take money from, from the military, yeah. who was big guy at Google until three days ago and quit saying, what have I done? Is that what you? I mean, it seems that, like that's absolutely true. It's absolutely and true, and it's kind of interesting. 
um, to hear and a little bit scary, I guess. Yeah, he's been generously funded by the Canadian government for a long time. Uh, before he went to Google, he created a company which was then acquired by Google and uh, brought his talents to um, Silicon Valley, so to speak. Uh, but he has recently decided that he is through uh, bringing his talents to Silicon Valley. Uh, Yes, and he's done this interview. So the, there's an interview with him saying that he's very concerned about what he has created. So Hinton, uh, along with two other people, is, is largely credited with innovating um, in deep learning, which is the idea of taking neural networks, a thing realized experimentally in 1959 and conjectured to be a good idea in 1943, and simply taking many, many, many layers of it as a general function approximation technique. And it is the technique that's underlying a, a most of the eye-popping results uh, if you, you know, today. ChatGPT included, that's just the, the latest eye-popping result of the last 12 months, but most of the things that have produced eye-popping results over the last decade have been under that particular uh, machine learning approach. So you talk a lot about in the book, there's a whole section of the book about ethics. Yes. <laughs> and the question is? <laughs> so what are we gonna do? Or what, uh, are, are we going in a good direction with ethics? Are we? Uh, there's a lot of. Um, or are we eugenicists, basically? I mean, not eugenicists, but. So I would say with ethics, there's a lot of one step forward, two steps back. It's it's a it's a battle front that is advancing and retreating regularly. Um, I would say in t around 2018, many of the most powerful companies were creating groups organized around ethics. In this calendar year, many of those companies have been firing at scale and anyone working on ethics. And in the interim, there was very little consensus as to what actually they mean by ethics. As we call it, I think uh, there's one chapter that's called the battle for data ethics. Uh, and also a battle to define how are you going to organize around ethics once you've defined, if you've defined ethics, how are you gonna actually actualize ethics and turn it into practice? So um, that battle is still up for grabs, including the battle for whether or not companies will even um, make the efforts to define ethics and to design, to design for ethics. And as far as what are we gonna do, well, there's, there's many forces at our disposal. So the book concludes by talking about state power, which we think of as being the power of regulation, among other things. Corporate power, which is the way that different companies um, act against each other sometimes, for example, in the realm of privacy, and people power, which is the way that individuals affect a, a form of private ordering, uh, which impacts companies themselves. Matt, did you want to jump in on ethics as well? I mean, I'll just say most of our uh, reflection and most of the history we tell about ethics is concerned with how machine learning systems are, li are having uh, negative impacts in the here and now in the very near future. And in so doing, we're drawing upon the, the critical uh, work of people like Kathy O'Neill, Rua Benjamin, uh, Meredith Whitaker, and others. Um, and it's a distinct uh, sort of moment of ethical and political critique from the one that Hinton more closely allies himself with, which, which has to do with sort of uh, much more longer term concerns about uh, the fate of, of humanity itself. Um, and the, the interplay of that conversation, in fact, I think is one, going to be a really important one in the weeks and, and months and years to come between a, a very localized concern with how are we deploying this in the here and now and these very long term uh, concerns about the, the, the fate of the human nights. There's a real tension going on. Um, and that's one that is going to have to, it's going to be up to people like our students um, to really carefully navigate and think through um, and not be deceived by confusing one and the other. Well, those were really interesting questions, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but, now, but now maybe you have some questions and I have a microphone I can give you if you don't have any There's questions. There's certainly one in the back and two there. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, don't just speak up. Oh, um, I see another microphone approaching. Oh, you have from... a microphone. Okay. Excuse me. 
Thank you so much for the book talk. It was really insightful. So I'm just kind of curious, especially from a historian's perspective, what do you think like the next five years looks for like a data scientist or just the, uh, the field in general? Hmm. So from a historian's perspective, what are the next five years of data science going to bring? I'm guessing only one of us is an actual historian. So Matt, would you jump in there? <laughs> uh, Usually I have Chris do the, the future. Um, well, one, one thing that I think is, you know, there's different ways to answer the question. One would be, what are the technologies going to look like? And one of the real challenges is going to be whether or not the kind of technologies that are so much in the news, like uh, chat GPT, whether they're going to be continued to scale. Um, that is, the environmental uh, and computational costs of some of these technologies are quite high. And it's not clear without some sort of radical transformation whether they continue to scale. So that's one way of answering. A different way of answering it would be uh, just in the last day or two, a lot of the people in, um, in Kenya and in other places who are doing a lot of the labor that is at the that is essential for training these large scale models have begun to organize themselves um, and to make themselves their present and so I think one thing that uh, is going to become more present is we're going to realize the the human labor behind this and the way that that human labor is distributed and instead of um, it being a story of say automation taking away jobs it's going to look a little bit more like other sorts of things where automation shifts. Um, where jobs are um, and, and depends very much on large scale differences uh, in, in wages and, and, and working conditions. Um, and then I think a third one is definitely that we're going to see continued uh, room both for innovation and debate in the way that we form curricula um, in places like Harvard or Columbia or elsewhere and thinking about how is it that we are going to train people um, to, to work in these domains. And, uh, you know, moments of contestation are going to be like, what ought to be all of the components of that kind of training that makes sort of uh, our historical inquiry into what makes a data scientist into a very pressing question of what curriculum ought to be uh, necessary to fulfill the multiple sort of roles that data scientists might have, including ones that... Um, in which you can't but have ethical and political questions all around you. Uh, right in the front. Uh, I have two questions, but I'm sure in your answers you are, you'll be able to concatenate uh, them together. <laughs> um, looking back uh, at Bludgeley Park and uh, the NSA that you mentioned, kind of the, the pioneers in data science and computation were government or public agencies and now it seems that the true that the pioneers are um, uh, not public agencies but private organizations and I'd like your take on kind of what this might uh, change or whether that doesn't change anything at all and combined with that um, I mean you I find it very fascinating that you say these terms that we use are very drifting and still, I mean, there seems to be a huge debate on regulating an AI, whatever that means. But I mean, no one, or, I mean, looking back, maybe did, did you find people crying for regulating statistics? Was that something in the Victorian age people called for to regulate statistics, this new big powerful tool? Um, yeah. Yes. Excellent questions. You're absolutely right. Uh, although I want to tease out one aspect of that dynamic. So the change in power from state power to corporate power is one of the major themes of part two of the book and how we perceive state power as being the power where the data are held and how the data are deployed. But in fact, um, right from the get-go, I mean, by the time World War II is, is done, the United States in particular was working hand in glove with Bell Labs in particular so that the actual code breaking while started at Bletchley Park in collaboration with um, GPO, so the British basically telecoms in the States, the telecoms was already handed, telecommunications was already handed over to a private corporation in the form of a government tolerated monopoly, namely AT&T. AT&T's research arm was Bell Labs. And by the, and NSA, as like you can go to oral in history interviews with NSA um, 
mathematician saying, you know, Bell Labs was working hand in glove with us. You know, they were more than happy to work with us. So that was a tight relationship. So, whether, so we perceive it as being about state power, but the truth is the military industrial complex was working hand in glove long before the phrase was, was coined, right? Even in World War II, there was a military industrial complex around data science. It's just we didn't know that for decades, right? It was classified for a long time. The development of IBM's, you know, computers, funded by NSA, and that, and that was intimately connected even with the development of artificial intelligence. A, a, one of the people who created and designed and operated the first IBM machines was one of the organizers of the Dartmouth Conference in 1956. So the intelligence community has been part of the story of artificial intelligence since the phrase was coined. But you're right that in, with that transition from state power to corporate power, we have lost the checks and balances that in democratic countries we expect to have on power. We expect there to be a people power check on state power, but we, particularly since the 1980s in the United, in the United States, are normatively uninterested in checks and balances on corporate power, which is partly why we have this debate over ethics as an ill-formed, capacious term that sort of we're using for all the ways in which we want companies not to be evil, and yet there are no design checks and balances on the power of, of private corporations. As far as regulation, it's extremely variable from what you mean by state. So it's a function of what you mean by state. For example, US federal regulation is largely done in a sectoral approach. So you have a financial crisis, you stand up the SEC, and it, and it goes after this sector. You have a separate sector, you have a separate form of regulation around finance, for example. Well, you, what you have, though, that is cross cutting is the FTC. And in fact, Lena Khan just had an op-ed, was it today or yesterday? That's based, the headline of which was, let's regulate AI. That said, you can get regulation not from the US federal government, but from individual states so, or from European Union. So EU has GDPR, which went into effect in 2018. California has its own sort of California GDPR in the form of CCPA. Uh, I think Somerville actually outlawed face regulation. Am I remembering correctly, Matt? Matt, you're more Bostonian right, than yeah. I. Um, so that sort of regulation can happen from states. It's just, it's difficult to do in the US federal context, in, in large part because of the sectoral nature of US federal regulation, as well as normatively that the electorate simply doesn't expect our elected officials to regulate quite so much and not to regulate at the level of a technology as happens in other sectors. Matt, that was a long rant. Can you, uh, what, what do you no, think? No, that was, that was wonderful. I would say, as we uh, engage in this discussion on regulating AI, I, there's a danger, well, there's going to be a, a lot of rhetoric about, well, this is an attempt to, you know, this is an effort of Luddism, pushing back against the natural development of technology and science. And I think there's a danger in that because it treats that technology of science as, in, you know, growing entirely independent and that the state or uh, uh, or international bodies are somehow pushing against that sort of, you know, in, internal dynamic of development. And, uh, you know, part of our history is how, how many of the choices uh, about the development of this technology depend on the conditions that states, corporations, groups of people make possible. And so there is no sort of independent development of AI. It is it's something that emerges out of particular institutional funding, uh, uh, legal configurations. Um, and so the, when the, the serious conversation is very much got to be one which doesn't depend on a sort of vision of the absolute independence of science and technology, but really understands how it's rooted very deeply in the sets of organizations and funding that provide that. And that's going to lead to a conversation, I think, that's much more sophisticated than one that says there's this autonomous technology and there are Luddites against it, to one that says, look, there are huge ethical and political stakes um, that need to be taken seriously, and the diverse ways the technology could develop, develop and the possibility of them need to be taken seriously, too. Matt, if I can offer an, an addendum to your addendum, I realized I didn't answer your second question, which was, has anybody ever regulated statistics? The great example there is big data and the US government. So all of the regulation that we rely on today for you know, privacy like FOIA or FERPA, that all came out of fears of among the electorate and also elected officials of too much power in the hands of the state, specifically US government, 
late 60s, early 70s. So in fact, there was quite a bit of regulation about statistics in the form of regulations that would put a checks and balances on the, on the power of the US central federal government to, um, to have access to and to put to work our data. None of that concern and none of the checks and balances ported over in any way to private corporations having access to those data. So we don't have like a FOIA for private companies. We don't have a FERPA around ed tech, really. Like we've got all these regulations that we benefited from when people were very concerned about US government having too much data and too much power with that data and nothing like that around private corporations. So in a way, that was a set of regulations around statistics. So I really liked your, your image with the dumpster and the uh, Toy Story guy. Could yeah. you maybe elaborate what the uh, main fires in the dumpster are and why you're optimistic nonetheless? So in terms of optimism, I just feel like there's so many tools at our disposal in terms of, again, corporate power, state power, and people power. And, and the final chapter of the book is, is trying to enumerate those different sources of power so that people don't feel, for example, like, well, the only power at our disposal is US federal government, and, and there's no other tools at our disposal. And in terms of the dumpster fire, you know, again, chapter one is about the stakes. And, and as, as Professor Jones says, we rely heavily on prior work by Ruha Benjamin, Kathy O'Neill, and other people, and Virginia Eubanks, who have pointed out the ways that algorithms are already um, differentially distributing power. Right? Virginia Eubanks has this nice line where she says, she takes the line, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And that line is usually meant to be like, oh, some of us have access to the most awesome tools. And Virginia Eubanks is saying, no, no, that means that the people who are you know, trying to apply for you know, assistance are the ones who have to consent to surveillance in order to get the assistance of the state in that case. That is, the oppression is already here. It's just not evenly distributed among every, everyone. It's the people who are the most already disempowered who are subject to um, the most oppression right now. So in terms of the stakes, um, you know, there's our, our vanishing norms of privacy and our, our, our consenting to deep surveillance in exchange for convenience, our concerns about the health of the information ecosystem, to quote um, sort of government approved terms. Um, that's how we open the book is to try to say, we, we don't spend a lot of time on that because in part there's been such great literature over the last 10 years about what the stakes are. And in terms of the optimism, I just feel like there are so many tools at our disposal. It's just I think most people don't realize the tools that are at disposal. And depending on where you are, if you're a tech employee, if you're a data scientist, if you're an elected official, if you're working at a company that has the power to deplatform de another company, like when Apple suddenly changes its policies on privacy and costs another surveillance company billions, you know, billions of dollars in income, uh, there's actually many powers at our disposal. Matt, do you want to elaborate on either chapter one or chapter 13? Uh, I, I only say that in, in the middle of the book, we give this example of um, uh, Du Bois, the famous American uh, sociologist, criticizing uh, a man named Hoffman for writing what was take a, 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 a book about a, a statistical portrait of black Americans at the end of the 19th century. And what Du Bois shows is that there are fundamental statistical errors in Hoffman. Hoffman argues that blacks can't be insured and justifies a whole range of policies for uh, insurance companies. And that moment, I think, captures very much the way in which we want people to be critical of highly data-driven um, approaches to social problems but not critical in the sense of throwing them away from using all available kinds of tools and applying them in, in such a way that there's grounds for optimism, for thinking about ways that these could be turned to policies that uh, reflect better the flourishing of the kinds of democracies we want, rather than um, saying that nothing is sort of possible. So it's precisely by looking uh, and analyzing very carefully the dumpster fires we're looking at and then taking the whole range of critical tools and the whole range of different solidarities that we can produce with all kinds of different actors um, that we find a huge amount of optimism. So, so we have two more questions only, sorry, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards, maybe, yep. uh, when we're eating cheese cubes. Um, <laughs> we, have a, sorry, we have a question up here, and the two people with the microscope, so up at the top. So you mentioned uh, the labor in Kenya that was being organized right now. I think a lot of us look at you know data scientists as like computer scientists and programmers, but what does this sort of 
like newly organizing labor look like? What are the sort of problems that are sort of going on that front? Like, what is the labor? Like, how is the labor distributed in, in like, training? I think you mentioned uh, these large models. Matt, I think that was an invitation for you to expound on the Kenya. Agenda. Yeah, I, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk in the middle of our book, we talk about Bletchley Park. And when we talk about Bletchley Park, we don't focus just on Alan Turing, which is the way a lot of people tell the story. Why? Um, well, following in the footsteps of some really great uh, uh, historians of women in computing, we we note that Bletchley Park is data at an industrial scale and doing data at an industrial scale with very imperfect machines uh, requires teams of people that fit in different ways in institutional and disciplinary and other sorts of hierarchies. And at Bletchley Park, those people were mostly women. Um, uh, a lot of them sort of highly educated for the day, not unlike the kind of story that many of you might have encountered in Hidden Figures. And when so you tell the story of data more broadly, there's always a lot of labor and much of that labor is uh, hard to find. It's hard to see at the moment, um, and it's hard to see historically. Um, and so uh, if you read the documentation around how does chat GPT work, um, you'll see that it's trained on vast amounts of the internet, of Reddit, of Wikipedia, and other sorts of things. But there's a whole nother model where uh, reinforcement learning with human involvement is heavily used. Who those humans are is not specified. Well, it's turned out that we found out largely through, um, you know, really great journalists drawing upon uh, uh, other sorts of historians and critics, that it turns out that it's a lot of people doing the kind of work of deciding what's a good answer or not. Like, it's not accidental that ChatGPT produces seemingly human speech because there's teams of people grading its production to help it sort of do so. But it speaks much more broadly to the sort of worldwide phenomena of, of content moderation, which is done by people uh, largely in the shadows. A few ethnographers and others have tried to um, get at and, and, and talk about these sorts of people, but it's a central facet of, of the kind of AI we have now, which is an AI that is both empirical, but also an AI that depends on a widely distributed workforce um, that follows the contours of global capital and global unemployment. And that, uh, you know, it, it, an organization is a moment that is going to bring more and more of people into our context. So, and, you know, and one of the important things here is, of course, that machine learning is not the elimination of the involvement of people in this. It's going to be a different involvement with different sorts of people. So um, you kind of touched on the area I'm interested in a few minutes ago, but I'll go ahead and ask my question. So I've been an entrepreneur for the past 30 years. Um, uh, safe to say uh, my companies have all used data in various commercial applications, uh, starting with uh, I, was, I sold a company to America Online about 30 years ago and then um, work there to use data to personalize their service, uh, make it more interesting depending on what segment you fell into. And then I started a recommendation engine company and then a targeted advertising company, and now I have a company that extracts data from documents. And I'm getting a little tired of going to cocktail parties and talking to my family, and as soon as I get to the word data, people step back and say, oh yeah, you're one of those, you got one of those companies that spies on me. Hmm. So I've always felt that data gets a bad rap with the general public. People equate data with privacy intrusion. So I'm curious, I can't wait to read your book, but, uh, especially given what you said five minutes ago. Um, but do you think your book does anything to improve the reputation of data so that people reading your book will come away feeling like, God, I can't wait to um, share my data um, <laughs> the next time I get one of those, those uh, pop-ups that ask me to accept or not accept, I'm gonna accept. I don't know that there's a dearth of people sharing their data already. My sense is already people are pretty comfortable clicking on EULA's. Uh, that said, I, I do think the book will give people a more comprehensive sense of where their data is going and 
What are the interests of and the and the histories of the companies that are born that that um, use those data and how those how those companies are born, die, or acquired? Um, but I don't know that this book is going to celebrate data and its power as much as some other books out there. That said, it may be that that some books have been giving data a bad rap lately, but I think data has a pretty good history of being celebrated. Um, and there's certainly other books I can point you to about data and its celebratory nature. Didn't you say that uh, the roots of the etymology of data was to give? Yes. That's pretty good. <laughs> I love data. Sure. As, as a scientist, you know, I absolutely I, I, love data. I can't get enough of it. It's just too, it's a problem. Um, I just wanted to th thank the speakers, at, uh, both, um, for writing a fantastic book. Thanks so and much. Coming here and talking to us. I don't know why I'm holding this. <laughs> sorry. I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> thank you but, very much. I'm very sorry not to be there in person. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're feeling better. Um, but if you walk out the door here and you buy a book, no. Then you walk across to the library, there may be something to eat and cheese cubes. Cheese cubes. <laughs> Have your book more than cheese cubes. Have your book signed um, by at least one person. It's true. Um, and I just want to thank these uh, people very much because I'm in love with this book. So I, honestly, like if I were you, and I, I never say this, I would just buy it and then read it tonight. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm trying to say. OK, let's thank them. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming.